Okay. Um, good morning. Welcome to the meeting of the uh, Palo Alto City School Liaison Committee. Uh, the date is Thursday, November 19th, and the time is 8.32 a.m. And I guess the first step is on this side is the clerk will call the roll. Yes, of course. Chair Collins? Present. Board Member DiBrienza? Here. Council Member Koo? Here. Council Member Tanaka? Here. Four present. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, we have a, a, a potentially compact agenda and Ms. Ku, Council Member Koo, um, needs to leave by 9.30. So we'll try to move speedily through the beginning parts to get to the update on after school programming. Um, first is oral communications in this part, anybody who wants to address um, the committee on non-agendized items can do so. And uh, can the clerk just explain quickly how they do that? Uh, yes, of course. Um, if you'd like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand on the Zoom app or press star nine. Great, so now's the time to raise your hand if you wanna speak on a non-agendized item. And seeing none, we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of the October 15th, 2020 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, can the clerk take the vote? Yes, of course. Um, Chair Collins? Yes. Member DiBrienza? Yes. Council Member Koo? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Yes. Vote passed unanimously. Great, thank you. And next will be Superintendent and City Manager remarks. And this gives me a chance to introduce Deputy Superintendent Karen Hendricks, who is uh, sitting in for uh, Dr. Austin. And uh, Ms. Hendricks, do you want to lead us off with any remarks? Absolutely. Thank you for having me here on behalf of Superintendent Austin. I spoke with him this morning and have just a few brief updates for you. I think you're aware of our elementary school reopening, but I did want to take an opportunity to reinforce kind of the excitement and joy we're seeing at our elementary school sites. So we have over 2,000 students back on our sites. And as we have gradually rolled in waves of elementary students, kind of the best practice, the sense of safety and the sense of joy has increased with every wave. Um, so we've completed now the return of our grades four or five students. And um, that completes our elementary school in-person learning return. Um, but it has been just nothing short of joyous and exciting to be out at the sites, really seeing the process of teaching and learning in person again and the power of interconnectedness, which is something that I think we have missed. So even between masks and masks and sneeze guards and everything else, we have teachers and students who are face-to-face -face at a physically distant appropriate manner. And um, the interconnected um, relationship is just really powerful. So that's been exciting. Um, we've been working hard on our return to in-person learning for secondary schools. That is being um, somewhat derailed at this point with current information about the, the move back into the purple tier, but we're gonna continue to work on, on planning for that for, um, for um, January and beyond based on what we know and what we can do and what makes sense on behalf of our students and staff. So there will be more to come on that in the future, I'm sure. So I did wanna also extend my appreciation, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, some folks were on the Zoom already. I'll be departing at the end of January. So this may be my last opportunity to say thank you to all of my friends and colleagues in the city of Palo Alto. It has been really wonderful to get to know um, you and build relationships with you. I'll be heading down to Southern California for a superintendency um, and we'll take nothing but really appreciative thoughts of the folks in Palo Alto and the work we've done together. I'm excited to say that we have two people from the city on our um, interview panel for my position tomorrow for the deputy superintendent position. So I'd like to thank the, um, the uh, Palo Alto City Manager's Office and also Palo Alto Police Department for sending representatives to join us in this important recruiting process. And I think that that really closes um, the brief remarks that I had. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Chantal or Monique for the city side. 
Uh, it will be Monique, but I also wanted to say CSD will be helping on the interviews tomorrow. So we're really excited to, to participate. Uh, Thank yeah, you Monique. so much. Yeah. yeah, I didn't didn't want to name names of people, and I, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. Well, good luck, Karen. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity. Thank so you so thank much. you. On behalf of City Manager Ed Shikata, um, I, I wanted to uh, say that uh, like, like the school district, we continue to plan for uh, the time when uh, more staff will return to work. At this moment, we have essential staff reporting and sit, the city is open for business. We do have our, um, you know, all of our services either virtually or by appointment in an, in an appropriate manner. And, um, you know, with this again, fall back into purple, we're, um, uh, you know, just continuing to work on the plans. And I wanted to extend our appreciation to the school district staff who have answered questions about different HEPA filters and things like that. So it's been a, it's been a great opportunity to use what you've learned um, to help us think through our problem solving. So thank you for that. Staff um, have continued to work on the Churchill Enhanced Bikeway, um, considering the the comments that had been made in the past and, and the information and feedback we'd had from the school district and others. And we look forward to bringing this back to the board in early 2021. So sometime uh, in the early part of the year. Um, I also wanted to remind everybody that um, along uh, for our COVID response, uh, there, there is testing again this Friday at the Art Center. You can sign up for appointments and, um, and we've typically been testing between like right around 700 people um, each time we've had that uh, testing opportunity open. So uh, we encourage school staff to sign up, uh, small business employees to come by and get tested. Um, and again, most people are reporting that it takes less than five minutes to get in and out. So that's been a tremendous reliable uh, site and time. So it's, every, it's been every other Friday um, at the Art Center Auditorium. Um, also wanted to mention that we continue our discussions with small business to fine tune our uplift local uh, uh, program to uh, find ways to promote small business and restaurateurs and uh, local business in Palo Alto. Um, and we are, as a staff, encouraging everyone uh, to follow the recommendations regarding travel during this holiday period. Basically, stay home. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, do your best to find alternative ways to celebrate so we can uh, reduce the spread and, and continue making forward uh, process on that. Um, I would like to, um, I'm going to queue up Kristen right now because there's a couple of events coming up, a virtual tree lighting. Uh, we had the recent reopening of the Magical Bridge Playground. Um, and so I'll let her go ahead and uh, comment, comment on those things. Great, thank you, Monique, and good morning, council members and board members. Um, so as Monique said, normally we would do a in-person tree lighting at Lytton Plaza, um, usually the Friday before Thanksgiving. And this year, because of COVID, obviously, we're not doing that, but we still wanted to have a program for the community. So. We're gonna do it virtually um, and it's at 6 p.m. this Friday. And if you go on the city's website, you can find the Zoom link. So you can, um, anyone can watch the, the program. The mayor will be speaking. Our um, Pastor Baines will be speaking. He was the official um, chaplain for our police and fire department. And then there'll be two performances from by the Children's Theater. So um, just wanted to, 
keep doing things for the community that um, are as close to normal as possible and hopefully to help brighten people's spirits. Um, and then I also wanted to mention too that we are having a um, tree or not a tree, a home decorating contest for the holidays. And that information is also on our webpage. So people are being encouraged to really light up Palo Alto by decorating their homes. Um, so hopefully it won't be too <laughs> um, outrageous or put a um, stress on our power grid, but <laughs> um, I'm picturing like the Christmas vacation movie, but um, it should be fun and just trying to think outside the box on what we would normally do to just keep people, you know, happy and um, uplifted. So those two things are coming up. And then as Monique also mentioned this past Tuesday, we finally opened the Magical Bridge Playground. Um, we had opened all of our other playgrounds before, but because Magical Bridge is a regional draw and gets thousands of people, um, we really wanted to be thoughtful on how we opened it to ensure the safety of all the visitors. So um, it's open from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Tuesday through Sunday. Um, we're limiting the number of people in the playground to 55 at a time. And per the um, state and county health um, orders, the recommendation is to limit time to 30 minutes um, per visit. So we have um, the playground staffed every day, um, Tuesday through Sunday, that will be counting people coming in, um, asking, you know, reminding people to wear a mask. Um, social distance. And then um, we also have some stickers we've created for people who are not able to wear masks because of medical reasons. So um, it'll be obvious to others why someone is not wearing a mask and, you know, avoid any confrontation that might come with that. Um, and that was a great recommendation from the Magical Bridge Foundation, who we've been working with closely. Um, they've been great in helping us to reopen the playground. And then finally, I wanted to say on that as well. So the playground is open on Mondays. That's the normal um, day for cleaning. But we're also having some time on those Monday mornings for disability groups to reserve time um, to come in. So those would be, it could be a class from um, the school district, it could be a private school that has um, classes for children or adults with disabilities, and they can reserve a time to have a little bit more space and, you know, controlled setting at the playground. <laughs> All of that information is also available on our webpage, um, on the homepage, there's the, the news on the left and all of that information is there. So thank you. And that's all we have for our report. So thank you very much and happy Thanksgiving. Great, I, I do think, uh, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. I, I was just gonna say, um, thank you for the things that you are planning in town. I can say that, um, you know, not, not everyone in town has been avoiding parties and traveling and everything else, but many, many have. And I think a lot of our students, I'm especially thinking of our teenagers, but I think little ones too, have really been sort of hanging on this fall, just waiting for holiday travel and holiday plans. And now that it looks like those probably aren't gonna happen, kids, I think in general, are really feeling discouraged and set back. So doing the tree lighting and still having ways to participate, I think it's just, I mean, it, it's not gonna fix it all. Kids are still struggling, but I think that really makes a difference to have opportunities. So thank you for that. Um, and Magical Bridge reopening, I know that's been a long time coming and there's been a lot of advocacy for it. So thank you for prioritizing that. It obviously makes a difference for many of our community members. Um, and our family has gone several times to the testing at the Art Center and it is so easy and so quick and so efficient. And even my little guy who can't stand getting poked and prodded like doesn't think it's such a big deal anymore. So thank you, you guys are, knocking it out of the park in a whole lot of ways. I'm grateful for it. Other comments? I just want to, uh, again, echo Ms. DeBrianza. Thank you um, for all the activity to, uh, to rally the community. And it is, it is uh, important to note that even in purple tier, uh, playgrounds are allowed to be opened. I think we've, uh, the, the science and experience has shown us that outdoor settings and um, and uh, contact services are not uh, big sources of spread. 
So it, I think it's really great to see. I, I see playgrounds, I see kids on, on playgrounds all over town and it's great because they, as Mr. Brand said, they, they need the outlets. Um, it looks like we have a hand up for comment. Uh, does the clerk want to take the comment? Oh, go ahead. What, Ms. Koo, why don't we do you first and then we'll do the community comment. Oh, and Mr. Tanaka too, it's turned out. Um, I, I just want to say thanks to Ms. Hendricks and congratulations. I wish you all the best. Um, a question for, and I agree completely with Chair Collins and um, School Board Member DeRienza about <laughs> CSD and all the things that you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's really great that we um, have more activities for a lot of people here in town who are really adhering to the sheltering in place and making sure that there's no spread or mi minimizing the spread. So it's great that we continue the festivities as the best as best as we can. Um, I have a couple of questions for Ms. Uh, well, one for Ms. Hendricks. The number of kids coming back to school with the interaction with their teachers, how many average are in each classroom? Very small groups. That's a great question. So very small groups when we split them into the hybrid groups. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's between the eight and, uh, oh gosh, at the, at the most 14 students per day in a hybrid group. So very small and physically distanced within those classes. And usually pre-COVID, it's about 20, 22. Yeah, we, we run relatively small class sizes, you know, 19 to 22 to 24 kind of being in an upper range. So um, I, I think that right now, uh, I, I'd say it's probably maybe 12 max in the hybrid classes as I think about it. We do, um, we benefit from the generosity of supportive funding and our class sizes are, are relatively small to start with. Yeah, I, I'm glad that they're getting back and, you know, um, in a manner that doesn't have a larger number of kids, um, I worry about the children not being to not being able to be um, social and to have that kind of interaction in classrooms and so forth. So it's good to hear that there is um, some interactions going on and in, in classroom activities. Um, and I can add to that too that we're finding ways to. Um, to uh, permit that on the playgrounds and um, you know at the lunch tables in physically distanced ways. So the kids are engaging in activities inside and outside of the classroom in ways that are very well thought out and very well provided for in advance through all the safety measures that are in place. Yeah, I, I think you know people need to realize our youth is missing out on so much, so much. Uh, and so, it, it's a, it has a lot to do with their development through the years, each stage as they develop, there's different experiences and they're missing out on a lot as this pro, uh, pro, prolongs. So everybody should do their part. <laughs> Anyways, um, and then in the, in the decorations for the city yesterday, I was just kind of going through my internet and I saw the site where the space, in, in space, the uh, space they can see, um, you know, earth and where the populated areas are lit up and everything. I was thinking <laughs> maybe we can send a message to the spaceship wishing them a happy a Merry Christmas <laughs> if we have the decorations <laughs> um, with all the lighting up and everything. <laughs> but thank you very much for all of the great thoughts to bring in the community. Kristen and Monique and Chantel and everybody in the uh, CSD department. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, uh, also uh, congrats, um, Ms. Hendricks, on your uh, promotion. Um, so, uh, yeah, and thank you everyone else for your updates. Uh, a few quick questions. Um, has, um, on, the, on the school side, has there been any measurement in terms of uh, what the impact has been of remote learning in terms of like, are, are students doing better? Are they doing worse? Um, doing the same. I'm just, I'm just curious if, if any anything has been, um, you know, any studies or any, have you guys done anything on that I'll, side? I'll do that. Um, generally, no. The one indicator we have is that um, we do a quarterly report of what we call the DF list, children who are at risk of failing their class, and um, those numbers are approximately the same as what they were a year ago. 
Okay. Um, so that's the one real-time indicator we have. Okay, great, thank you. And, and then um, I was just curious, um, I noticed that um, like math and science are not offered in person, only like uh, the humanities are. Um, and I guess, what was the idea behind that? Um, I think you might be referring to our secondary reopening plan. And since that's largely moot at this point, because we will not be able to oh, reopen in purple. Doesn't matter then. Okay. Okay. Side. Yeah. okay. And then um, last question here is, as to, well, maybe this is mute as well, but um, okay. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask you about the impact, well, the potential impact of the Crosstown shuttle being missing, but maybe if you guys are gonna open, it doesn't really matter. So I'll yeah. skip that question. Thank you. I was going to say, yeah, public transit, not a big issue for our schools at this point. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, can the clerk take the call the public comment? Yes, of course. Um, uh, Cox, I am going to allow you to speak. Um, if you could just unmute yourself, then you'll be able to make your public comment. You will have two minutes as indicated on the timer. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. Um, my name is actually Rachel Cox, and I did um, email <laughs> a bunch of you yesterday. Um, I, I live across from Addison Elementary School, and the campus is currently totally locked up dur even after school hours, and um, construction is done. I guess uh, Amanda Boyce, the principal over there, got back to me and said that there's still two walls, uh, ball walls, that are going to be built, and it's too dangerous, and with purple tear and all that. Um, my concern is that it is a true community asset, and I've been a part of the communication going onward with Bob Golton around all this, um, and it, during the holidays, and we live across the street from Webster Wood is also there, and kids are going stir crazy, and they're the ones who go in after school and play basketball. They're not wrecking anything, um, and I'm just curious. I also believe there is a magical bridge over their playground. So my question has to do with at what point does the community interest also get weighed in some of this? I mean, all the kids are back there. I mean, not all of them. Some are doing remote learning. But um, I, I, I'm just curious about it. They're saying it's going to happen over winter break, but that's a lot of downtime. We've already lost, you know, years over there having access. So I just wasn't sure what the standard protocol was. I mean, if it really is, well, they're not gonna open it up till December. And this is coming from the district office, um, not necessarily Amanda, um, but you know, there are cones up there. They, when they fix things at other schools that are open or other parks, they just sort of block it off and then the rest can be open. So if someone can help me understand if, if I you know, just live with this, but I'm also got other community members asking me about it and particularly Marcus over at Webster Wood. <laughs> so anyway, um, any, any answers would be helpful. All right, thank you. Um, I, can, I can speak to that very briefly. I was on the thread with uh, Ms. Boyce, Principal Boyce at the school. And I think the last email I saw was a pretty thorough discussion of what the issues were and why the um, site was not able to be open at this time and what the plan was for completing work um, that would enable them to get it open. So I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that. And I, I'm not sure what else um, there is to do. She, I think she addressed the details of it in her email to, to you, Ms. Cox. If you think otherwise, I, I encourage you to write back to her and, um, and, and ask more questions. I'm sure she'd be happy to oblige. Um, but uh, I know, I know you're engaged with the right person. She's definitely the expert on all things, uh, all things Addison. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Okay. All right. So moving along on our agenda, uh, we, we um, in order to accommodate everyone's schedule, we're going to flip the update on after school programming with the COVID-19. Um, Chantel, were we able to get the person who can yes. do that? It's Miss O'Kane. She's oh great. Well, then we're way ahead of the game. Yeah. All right, uh, please take it away. Uh, so just to, to open it up, um, at one of your previous meetings, there was a request to have a little bit of information about what we're doing with after-school programmings right now, especially related to um, 
the fact that we're still in a climate of COVID and um, just wanting to know what programs are available and where they are. And um, Ms. O'Kane will be providing that update. Great, thank you. Am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna start out with our middle school athletic program. So as you know, the city provides or offers after school sports to the three middle schools um, throughout the, the school year. Um, we've been able to um, sort of change up the program a little bit um, in light of the social distancing requirements. And so we've had a scaled back middle school athletic program that started in September. Mm -hmm. And it's really a skills-based program. So they're not doing competitive play. They're not um, even doing um, practices together as a group, but what they're doing is just skills um, work. And so they're able to social distance, wear masks and be outside. Um, so we just finished our third series of that. So we had one in September, one in October, one in November. We're taking a pause now because of weather, um, because we're not doing anything indoors. And if we can, we will start back up in January with um, girls and boys volleyball, co-ed football and co-ed cross country. So we're hoping to continue that moving forward. Um, and it's been offered at a reduced price from what we would normally offer or charge for the full middle school athletic program. And we've had over 400 kids participate in this program. So it's been very popular. Um, I think a great way for kids to get a little bit of exercise and still you know, have some social interaction, although it's socially distanced. Um, so I'll continue then with the other things that um, CSD is providing. So we're still, um, we also have some sports that are offered to anyone through our recreation programs. So these are all outdoors. So we've had tennis and soccer. And in the winter, we will start with pickleball if we're able to do that, um, depending on what the health order says. Um, we've also offered an outdoor cooking class for kids ages six through 13. Um, and we have some virtual classes too. So these are more the academic classes like writing, math, public speaking, and then also quite a few coding classes we've been able to offer. And then we'll have um, some additional STEM classes virtually offered in the winter as well. Um, and then we're also still doing our leadership program. So the Palo Alto Youth Council is doing everything virtually. They've had virtual debate watching parties um, during the election. They've um, did a social media campaign to educate youth on the city council candidates leading into the city election. And we're, they're also helping work, work on a Martin Luther King project. Um, and then the teen advisory board has also still been active um, also virtually. So again, we're trying to, um, and then our children's theater and the art center are also um, providing lots of programs in person and virtually for kids, including um, the children's theater has some sensory friendly um, programs um, that have been designed with the Magical Bridge Foundation. So um, really just trying to keep kids engaged, keep them, you know, being able to be with their peers in an out, a setting that's outside of their normal classroom. Um, so, and we're open to any suggestions of what you think might be a great offering to do virtually um, or outside. So um, that's our update. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Go ahead, Council Member Cook. Thank you, Kristen. That, that's amazing. Over 400 youths participating in the um, after school sports program. Those are the sports programs, right? Right, at the middle, yeah, the middle school. The middle school. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so we have the middle school kids with activities. Is the cooking and tennis and soccer, including the younger elementary 
and the high school kids or our, our recreation classes like tennis is for ages five through 18 and they're it's for different levels soccer's um we use an organization called kids love soccer and that's for ages three to six um it says three to six i'm feeling like it's three to 16. Um, I can double check on that. And then the outdoor cooking class was ages six through 13. And then the academic classes are young age through teenage. Okay, so, so throughout the different age groups then. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's, it's a window to seeing how the youth are doing, you know, because my kids are through with school and um, sheltering in place kind of isolates me as well. So it's a great window that you provide to see what the kids are, how they're, how they're doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Tanaka. Yeah, also, yeah, thank you for the update. Quick question. Um, so I think for middle school sports, we increased the fee quite a bit. Do you know um, what kind of impact, if any, that has had? Well, we haven't implemented that increased fee because um, because we're not offering the typical program, we created a new fee for this, um, this scaled back program. Um, so it's a fraction of what the, the other program would be. So we haven't been able to get data on that. Other questions or comments on this? Thank you I, for uh, keeping, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead, Mr. Branson. <clears throat> I was just going to say thank you for keeping doing what you can, right? I mean, it's not it's not serving every kid's needs, but it's hundreds of kids that are that are getting some opportunities to participate. And you know, I think we're all really worried about the kids at this point. So anything we can keep going, I think we really have to push forward and keep going with for those who are comfortable participating. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I echo that. And the only thing I'd add is if there's anything uh, additional that the district can do, <clears throat> and this is. <clears throat> excuse me, this is obviously an area where you guys take the lead, but we provide a lot of the facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, these are extraordinary times. So if there's anything in addition that we can do or that you need or that would allow you to serve more or reach out better or whatever you need to do, um, please, please, please let us know. In fact, I'll give you Karen's direct cell number down in Southern California. You can call her <laughs> and, and she'll, she'll get it done. I mean. You can um, absolutely call anytime. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, 400 is great, but and you know, to, it's it, it's putting together a puzzle. We have about 3,000 middle school students, mm -hmm. so you know, it's a big group. They have lots of different needs. We need to provide lots of different options for them, and you know, I know that's what you do. So um, greatly appreciated. Yeah, I I just like to add, it is. It's a very thoughtful and and a wide array of offerings, and our middle school kids talk about it, and they. Have, appreciate it. So we really thank you for what, what you're doing with that. I, I, I let me just echo that that kids, the middle school kids love the after school. Sports. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they really, they really love it. I don't know. I'm really grateful for the city for running that program as you have for years. Um, because that is a very widely accessed and very greatly valued program among our, our school community. Um, Okay, I think that's it. No public comment on this topic. Thank you, Ms. O'Kane. I did skip over in my anxiousness to get there. I skipped over the review of city council and PAOSD board meetings. Um, so why don't we go back and do that? That's item four on our agenda. Um, anybody on the city side want to take a lead? Oh, it looks like Mr. Brands, are you going to offer? Uh, I thought you were putting your hand no, up. I'm happy to do it, but I was not raising my hand. Oh. I just caught. Oh, uh, anybody on the city side, council members? Uh, I, I can start. Um, as you know, Foothills Park is now open to, um, to uh, non-residents as well, to everybody. Um, Foothill, there Foothill Nature Preserve, no? Mm -hmm. Foothill Nature Preserve? Did we yeah, Foothill that? Nature Preserve. Thank you very much for... Um, for <laughs> <laughs> correcting me. Uh, and um, there is a um, limit of, there is a cap of number of visitors um, up to a, a, a thousand, but for the first 90 days, it's going to be at 750 and then 
it'll be raised up. Um, so staff did a great job. They're going to still work on, you know, making sure that there is protective measures put in place uh, for the nature preserve. Um, we also uh, had um, in the, our last meeting, the San Antonio corridor, um, there was one project of 102 um, dwelling units that has been approved um, through the, um, what is called the HI, P program, the housing incentive program. Um, however, at the same time, and not however, and at the same time, um, the corridor has been, the HIP program has been expanded to 16 other properties, 16 other parcels there. So um, the, um, the number of units in this program is actually at a very high density and there's a lot of incentives that are provided. And, and um, so that is another area to watch um, in terms of um, uh, um, walkability, bicycling, um, accessibility to schools, um, uh, and uh, safety, of course. So um, that's another area to be watching and to um, coordinate closely with uh, Palo Alto Unified School District, just in case there are families. Well, for sure, there will be families that will move into um, the housing there. Um, so there needs to be coordination um, uh, conducted. Um, there's not going to be too much retail there because a lot of the program incentives is also to reduce the square footage for uh, retail and also community serving type of businesses. So, you know, there will be the need of um, um, travel to, to, to get to those kind of services. Um, I'm sure uh, Council Member Tanaka can add more, but those were some of the bigger things, bigger items that we discussed in the last week. Council Member Ku, did you guys want to mention the race and equity updates as well? Um, I'll leave that for you or for Council Member Tanaka. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Tanaka, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to add? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess uh, the one thing I just want to mention, and it, it's something which maybe uh, warrants a, a further discussion at some point, is, um, and this was on consent calendar, so it wasn't a, something we really talked about a lot, but um, you know, we did uh, approve a contract with the uh, Alto Community Child Care for five years for the management of the CBE's Child Care uh, Subsidy Program. It's about a $2.6 million dollar um, contract, but um, you know, I, I've been hearing a lot from child care providers as well as parents, and um, the challenge around that in terms of COVID. And um, so, anyways, um, it's not something that's not necessarily something on our agenda today, but it's something which I, I do know is kind of a, especially if, we, if we're trying to reopen somehow. A lot of working parents, it's kind of a concern, and for a lot of operators, it's a concern just in terms of their own viability, but. Um, anyways, just this is. Uh, uh, I just want to mention that because I've I've been hearing a bit about that from from folks, and um, I think we're going to have to figure this out eventually. Thanks. Yeah, the only thing I uh, before we move on to the school side, um, I just wanted to add. Uh, Councilmember Ku touched on it. Um, it's great that we're adding housing on outer San Antonio. Um, but one thing to be aware of that uh, for that area is that it is one of the very few places in um, Palo Alto that is more than a mile from the nearest uh, elementary school. Um, uh, the other the other place, notable place being, by the way, Sand Hill Road, where there are 600 units uh, built by Stanford uh, about 20 years ago. But as we build out that outer San Antonio thing, I think that creates a challenge that the district will have to face, we'll probably need to um, uh, partner with the city to figure out how to deal with it. Not only are those kids more than a mile from the nearest school, uh, you need to cross San Antonio, Charleston and Middlefield in order to get there. Um, there literally is no other school that you don't have to cross those three schools. Those are three pretty busy streets um, during uh, go to school and come home from school time. So, uh, 
we're really creating a challenge for ourselves to make sure those kids have the kind of access to school uh, facilities that we want all kids to have in Palo Alto. So uh, we'll need to be mindful of that. One thing I noted that was that the um, project that was approved there is primarily a studio and one bedroom apartment project. I think there were a handful of two bedroom apartments and we do see fairly low student generation rates from um, though not, not by no means zero uh, from one bedroom apartment properties. Um, so it's just something that I think we, the district have to be um, mindful of and make sure if you're gonna, uh, if it seems likely that you're gonna develop more housing out in that corridor, um, making sure we have a strategy for addressing how those kids are gonna be able to access their, um, their school facilities in a way that is, uh, is similar to other kids. Um, that was the only thing I had to add to that. Ms. DeBranda, did you wanna say anything about that or should we move to the school side? Um, I pretty much echo what, what you said. It was I was so happy to see that housing was approved, and then I was thinking, yeah, it's not going to be easy to get them to elementary schools. <laughs> um, and and that happens to be true about a lot of places that we're looking at building housing, right? From Ventura to just like the places where it's obvious to build some, it, there's not easy access to schools, and it's a I mean, big picture, it's a problem. And I, I hope that there are solutions that are not super, super expensive, but it's something we're just going to have to deal with in a coordinated way in the, in the coming years, because hopefully there will be more housing built in town. So. Yeah, I'd say the main thing is uh, just to build on what you said, is that we said the same thing about the North Ventura thing is like, just let's just work together. Um, if you incorporate us in your planning process, then we are much more likely to be able to come up with good solutions rather than bolting them on afterwards. So. I hope you'll include us in your in your planning processes. Um, okay, on uh, I'll, I wrote down a couple things for recent meetings. Mr. Brianda, do you want me to go first, and or do you want to go first? I'll go first. Um, the biggest event at our recent meetings were our discussion of our secondary reopening plan, um, uh, which. Uh, you know, took a lot of thought and effort on the staff's part. A lot of many, many people, all stakeholders were involved. And then uh, we're in the process of gathering input of what people would like to do in terms of uh, parents and students choosing programs when we were abruptly uh, moved to Purple Tier, uh, which by the state regulation prevents schools that are not already opening from reopening. So if we are in Purple Tier in January, uh, we will not be able to open the schools at that time. And we will not be able to open them at all until uh, we are back into red tier. And there is no, um, with, there's a waiver program that's been in place since the summer, but that's only for grades K through six. So there's no waiver available. But we have some students on our campuses though way we have students on campus now does not constitute being open for secondary schools. So there is no, there, there is no loophole, there is no process here to get open other than to exit the purple tier. And to exit it for two weeks, by the way, we have to, once we're in red, we have to be two weeks in the red, two consecutive weeks uh, before schools can open. Um, that will significantly up, um, impact our, uh, our thinking about getting open for secondary schools because if we are not open at the beginning of the second semester for hybrid, um, then the challenge will be just as it was in the fall, uh, do we want to um, inc uh, absorb the level of, have students and, and faculty absorb the level of disruption um, entailed by trying to move during the semester? Um, so that will be a, a decision that staff and um, maybe the board ultimately makes, um, but I can, I can tell you there's not a lot of not a lot of appetite for additional disruption. Um, I think people have felt pretty disrupted all along. So, you know, just as in the summer where we were planning on hybrid and then on July 17th, the governor announced that we would not be able to open. Um, this is a similar scenario where we were planning on opening on January 8th or 9th, I think. And now per the governor's uh, announcements that we're in purple tier, um, we will not be able to open until we're able to return to red. So, um, so that was, a, we spent most of our time on, on that, frankly, over the last month to have it uh, just uh, temp typical for 2020, uh, the underlying circumstances changed and um, our plans, our plan, our plans have changed with them. Um, 
The other, the other two things I, I wanted to mention from a scheduling point of view is we moved our December 8th meeting to December 15th. I know you're all circling that on your calendar. So just in case you wanted to attend, we're now on December 15th, not December 8th. Uh, we will be seating a new board member on that day. Um, oh, and I, I, I should say before I add the last one, we did have a very nice uh, send off for our longest serving uh, board member, Ms. Baden Caswell, who um, served, ended her service of 13 years on the uh, on the school board, one of the longest serving board members in history. Um, and there was a very nice um, gathering of, uh, a virtual gathering of former board members who served with her, former superintendents who served under her. Uh, her family was all there and spoke. It was really um, appropriately uh, substantial and moving for someone who has given so much to our city and our schools uh, for so many years. So um, that was her last regular meeting. She's still serving, obviously, until a new member is sworn in. But uh, uh, we really, I really enjoyed. I think we all really enjoyed the the send off for uh, Ms. Baden Caswell. Um, the one other scheduling item I wanted to mention is we are having a study session focused on our Title IX uh, complaint and. Um, I guess general, general processes related to Title IX um, on, I think, tentatively scheduled for December 8th uh, with the exact time being determined sometime in the late afternoon or early evening. Um, and so, uh, and that's gonna be primarily a listening session where students who have been uh, impacted by uh, sexual harassment or assault issues and or have um, concerns and views about those issues will be able to speak to uh, the board and the senior staff. And that'll be a virtual, that'll be a virtual meeting, of course. And so uh, you should see that um, posted at some point the first week of December and um, again, tentatively scheduled for uh, December 8th. Ms. DeBriand, anything to add to that? You summed it up. The reopening plan and perhaps thwarting of the plan was really all I had to add, um, but also want to thank Ms. Peyton Caswell for her 13 years of service. Yeah, but I think that's it. I mean, all, all we've got at this point is if we if we can't open up in January um, in a hybrid model, then what can we do to get kids on campus in any way, shape or form and, and better support them for kids who this is this distance learning is just not working for, which is a substantial number. I think the teachers are doing a really good job, but you know, it's yeah. so. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I really echo Ms. Baden Caswell. It's like, on the one hand, our teachers are doing a tremendous job. I mean, really tremendous um, of, uh, of addressing kids' needs with distance learning, but just, there's no one size fits all in education. And there are definitely a large number of students from distance learning is not a good mode of education. And for virtually all kids, the lack of social connection with peers and with adults is you know devastating for both their short-term mental health and their overall long-term development, and so you know one of the things we're fo we'll be focused on if we cannot get open is what can we do um, to meet those needs of students. And I know uh, I met with Dr. Austin and some of his staff yesterday, and I know they are uh, working hard on those issues um, as a backup plan if we are not able to open. Um, so I think that's what we got. Any questions or comments on that before we move to the next item? Seeing none, uh, let's see. So next will be COVID-19 coordination update. And uh, I don't know who wants to lead this off. I think this is a staff item, right? I think it was one of those items that we felt given the current state of affairs was an ongoing item that we would have discussions about. Um, I think I mentioned the some of the public works and facilities related coordination that has gone on with the school district and our public works department. Um, I am not sure, I don't know if Ms. Hendricks has anything else to add in the last month. I don't know that there's been anything else specific and maybe Ms. Gaines knows. I think the only other thing I'd add is we've been in coordination with uh, Ms. Lana Conaway about um, the COVID testing that you all have going on and 
Uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach for our child care providers in the city. And so that's been um, a good coordination opportunity for us to make sure that they also have access to testing uh, a little bit more frequently than um, even just the biweekly testing that we offer at the city. So that's probably the other positive update that we've just been trying to make sure people that are um, essential workers out there really doing the work that they can have access to testing uh, more frequently. And so we've been working with you on that. We appreciate that. And we have been pushing that information out to staff in addition to the COVID testing that we're working on through our own district. So it's been really helpful, I think, in terms of giving our employees different options that are convenient and frequent. So we're really appreciative of that. Um, I'll add too that it's, it's been extremely helpful to continue to share just knowledge and expertise with community partners, because as we um, roll into different sites, and implementing different safety practices. Um, I think we're all working on best practice around that. So we've moved now into the middle school and high school phase in terms of external and internal safety measures. So any uh, communication coordination we've done with city folks related to those things from HVAC systems to MERV 13s to, um, to all those best practices and protocols have been really helpful. So we greatly appreciate that. And I did wanna admit, uh close my remarks by mentioning um, uh, Council Member Koo has attended some of the Citizen Corps Council uh, phone calls and updates uh, throughout this time period since, what is it now, March, since March. Um, and the school district is also a participant uh, in those calls and, and it's helpful to get those regular updates as well. Um, so we really appreciate that. Mr. Branta. Um, I just wanted to ask where the city is. I haven't, we haven't, we talked about this early on and, and I don't know what the current sort of best practice is, but um, when the mask, when the mask requirement first started, uh, there was talk about how easy it was or how difficult it was for the police to enforce it. And, you know, on, on weekend nights and stuff, we see a bunch of teens at, at town and country and hanging out at Pally and everything else. And it, what is the current thinking or do you know where the police are? Are they asking people to wear masks? Are they trying to separate kids if they're together? I know Halloween had an embarrassingly high number of big parties, <laughs> if my daughter's Instagram feed is any indication. Um, and so I'm wondering where the police are right now with trying to enforce against those big gatherings and mask wearing and everything else. Um. The last that we discussed it was, it was, you know, a, more of an educational kind of enforcement. Um, it, there's no enforcement per se. It's more uh, trying to be, uh, you know, take an opportunity to- Remind and educate. And remind, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and that was the last that I had heard, but I can certainly follow up and get back to anybody. Yeah, just, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a combination of everyone has pandemic fatigue and kids need to be around other kids and yet, you know, they don't have great judgment all the time. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sounds like we have to give the police access to Mr. Brands' daughter's Instagram feed for, for leads. Um, okay, uh, thank you for that update. And I guess we can move to item number seven, which is updates on ongoing matters. And the first is Coverly. Any update on Coverly? Um, no, I don't think so. We're just continuing to work um, with the um, school district staff, Eric Holm, who's um, doing more of the facility management, but we're communicating with him all the time on, you know, just ensuring that the facility is clean, that, you know, any issues are being resolved. So I think, um, we're just continuing to move forward with the, the new um, lease and the relationship that we have. Let me just ask the members, should we continue to have this on the agenda? I think we've kind of reached a somewhat stable state. What do you think? Until we're ready to take more action, I don't see much reason to, we're kind of getting the same update these days, right? It's yeah. status quo at this point. I see Council Member Kuhn nodding. Does everybody agree with that? Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll remove this from the future agenda. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, and Ms. O'Kane, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with this issue, 
Um, but we have a very active and somewhat concerning um, uh, interaction going on with PG&E um, around uh, their seeking an, an easement on the property for a gas distribution pipeline and related, uh, uh, related aspects of it um, and threatening a condemnation uh, procedure against the district um, in order to get their easement since the uh, district at this point is not interested in, in granting it, um, which I find, I, I, I think is, I, I'm, I'm gonna get a more detailed update today, but I find it um, potentially quite concerning since it may impact our future plans with what you and we wanna build there. If there is a gas distribution pipeline running through the property with an easement to perform testing on it, I mean, both, both of those things are like red letter items for me that I want to understand. And it appears that PG&E, I mean, I won't go to their motives, but they are moving incredibly fast without and, and showing no give um, in their position. They are, in fact, threatening to potentially file a condemnation suit within a couple of weeks. Um, and I... I think we, I, well, part of the reason I raise this is I think it may um, require a rallying of the stakeholders, including our community constituents, as well as the, you know, the city agencies um, to, uh, to get them to back down on this so that we have time to evaluate it appropriately and make sure we don't get forced into something that could have impact, significant impact on a site we all care deeply about for literally forever. Because once they put the, build the pipeline, I don't think it's going away. Um, so I, I, I guess I want to ask as part of my uh, getting information about this, does anybody, had anybody on the city side aware of this issue at all? Is this the first time you're hearing about it or did you guys know about it? This is the first time I'm hearing about it. I don't know if Monique or um, council members have heard about it. Yeah, because you guys are stakeholders in this too, and that you own, I mean, this is on the part of the property that we own. But, you know, I know for schools, we have um, very strict setback provisions for toxic substance pipelines, um, and not to mention explosion risk and everything else. And, you know, it's, it's I'm, 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 I'm very concerned that we are being rushed into something that we don't understand that could have material impact on something we've spent years trying to figure out how to develop. So we may be reaching out to you to engage you in, um, in working with PG&E um, because uh, yeah, I've been, I've been taken aback at, uh, at the, the speed that they're trying to move at during, the, during this time. And I've been taking some notes. I'll make uh, public works and uh, utilities aware um, of the situation and they may be reaching out to the school district Thank you. The, I think the particular people who are on this from our side are Carolyn Shaw, who is our chief business officer, and now Komi Vishakan, who is our general counsel, is actively involved with it because it's basically becoming a legal matter at this point. Um, and Eric Holm, who you guys obviously know well, is also aware of it, um, though I'm not sure he's involved in the legal aspects of it. Yeah, you might want to give um, the city council, the city lawyer, I forgot what she's, what the title is, a uh, heads up as well. I'm sorry? City attorney. City attorney, thank you. City council, that's not right. Um, yeah, because this has become illegal, you know, we're, we're basically, they're, they're, they're basically threatening to, to sue for condemnation within a small number of weeks. Um, so this is a, a quickly becoming a legal first matter as opposed to a practical matter. So, okay, well, I'm uh, useful to get the input that you guys are not even aware of it because that's disturbing by itself. Council Member Cook. Oh, that's very concerning. So thank, thank you for, ver uh, for bringing this up so that we, um, we, ha we, we become aware of it. And maybe staff and yours can kind of get the information so that it can di be distributed to the rest of the council members as well. Um, really good idea. And of course, city manager and executive staff. Yeah, I think we need to get the word out on this, folks, because I think part of what's going on is as long as it's quiet, it's uh, yeah. you know, that 
uh, PG&E kind of knows they're, they're really, really good at doing this. And we're really, really, really distracted. And so if the community never becomes aware, then it's done. It's I mean, this, is, this is during the COVID times when we're all not fully, um, like you said, distracted. Yeah. But thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Can so, I ask a clarifying question, Chair Collins? So yeah. I know there's an existing PG and E easement through Cubberly. Is that where they want to put the pipeline in, or it, would it be a brand new easement? Do you know? It, it looks to me. I have not. I've I've just read some of the a couple of the backgrounds materials, and so I don't have all the context yet. Mm -hmm. um, is okay. It looked to me like a brand new easement. Okay, thank um, you. They're actually suing for condemnation to obtain it. So it didn't look like it was continuing. I don't know how it relates though mm -hmm. to prior easements that might exist. So I'm, I'm sort of, I just know this one, I have this narrow view of it. I don't really have the context yet. All right, thank you. Um, but I, I can assure you, you'll, hopefully you'll be finding out more about it soon because one of the things I'll ask if it's appropriate is for our attorney to share information with the city so you guys can be up to speed about what's going on as well. Uh, okay, that was a little bit of drama. And then the other item on the agenda, on our standing agenda is the X cap or grade crossing. Yes, and I have an update that I received from staff. So I'm just gonna go through it. Um, so I know that a lot of people are following this process, but I'll just bring you all up to speed and just in case. Uh, so the XCAP expanded community advisory plan has completed their deliberation process for the evaluation of alternatives for Churchill, Meadow and Charleston. The panel is currently in report writing mode um, to provide their recommendations to the city council. So they're meeting regularly, making edits, collaborating with panel members and seeking feedback comments from the public on the various elements of the report. In November, two meetings were held uh, the past two weeks or this week and last week, and no meeting is anticipated due to Thanksgiving next week. So future meetings are scheduled for December the 2nd, the 9th and the 16th to further edit and finalize the report. All documents and materials are on their website and in terms of the actual crossings for the Churchill crossing, the XCAP has come up with a consensus regarding a road closure with option two, which provides for uh, a bike lane in the center of Churchill Avenue crossing the railroad tracks. And for Meadow Charleston, the panel was divided um, and was not able to come up with consensus on a particular recommendation. So they'll be providing information on pros and cons and recommendations on various alternatives in their report to the city council. And so that is the update of where they are. We believe that they'll be bringing the final report to the city council in early 2021. There's no set date right now. Great, thank you. I see there's a hand raised for public comment. Can we call that person? And then we'll come back to you, Mr. Tanaka. Yes, of course. Um, so again, if uh, we have one attendee, Ken Joy, I'm going to allow you to speak. If you can unmute yourself, you'll have two minutes on the timer. Thank you. I know that uh, members of your committee are very uh, keenly interested in the safety of Palo Unified School District students who have to cross the train tracks. And I want to mention to those of you on the school side that the city is uh, currently beginning a process to upgrade its bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan. Uh, my name is Ken Joy. I serve as the chair of Payback, the uh, Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee. And I just want all of you to know that we welcome input from all segments of the community regarding this plan update. Uh, the process is gonna unfold over the next uh, 18 months perhaps. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to uh, participate. We welcome all that input. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And there are no other speakers. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. I was wondering if uh, staff just wants to quickly mention to the school board about the issue with uh, the Measure B money in, in VTA, the Bar to San Jose. Thank you, Council Member Tanaka. Um, I will try to sum it up, but if I miss anything, please fill in right behind. So uh, we received the Measure B funding budget outlook from VTA 
and it had um, no allocation for the grade separation projects within this first 10 years. And I believe it's 10 years. And so the city sent a letter to VTA as well as some of the other cities uh, in the North County area in particular that were just expressing um, that that was not what we expected and asking for more conversation around that. Uh, I can pull up the letter too, so I can um, share any specific details. But uh, essentially the funding right now in the earlier time has been focused on the BART project. And so we sent a letter just asking for alternatives to the way that VTA is looking at that funding setup. So I'll pull that up, give me a second. And Council Member Tanaka, I, I don't know if you wanted to mention anything else while I find the letter and see if there are any specifics. No, but I, I think the, the, the big issue is, I think the voters, when there should be passed, at least the voters here in our city, I would, I would think, had the expectation that they were taxing themselves to help pay for this grade separation. And um, but unfortunately, it looks like the measure really didn't have the explicit, it was more of a I guess, informal understanding versus a formal understanding. And so it looks like, um, you know, there's not a, a legal uh, obligation that the money actually comes to us, even though that maybe was the way it was marketed and the way it was positioned to the community here, which is very unfortunate. So, um, so anyways, it, I think it, it, you know, I don't know if there was even funding enough funding to begin with, even with measure B, but now there's a bigger question. So um, anyways, that's, that's, I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Yes, and, and it's significant as well of just the timing of the funding. So even the letter shared from the city of Mountain View, which also uh, sent the letter to VTA is just pointing out um, the setbacks that this could mean for the project, but in particular, um, thinking about whether VTA bonds or other options for still getting the funding here, um, because that could be the issue is just when we would receive the funding, given that they've prioritized the BART project. So if I can just ask, because I'm, this is a complex topic and I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I think I'm standing was that, I, I guess it was called measure B, um, which was a, was that a sales tax? Measure, what was the source of funding on that? Bonds, sales tax? I think it's a sales tax. Yeah, so it was a major, it was an ongoing funding source that we all believed was going to be a source for um, four grade separation projects, both in our towns and other towns. Um, and not maybe the sole source, depending on what uh, grade separation strategies we chose, but a major source. And I, I believe all along access to this funding was one of the major drivers of our timing. Um, we wanted to make sure we got in the, in, the, in the queue to make sure we could access the funding before it ran out. And now we're being told, now that there's a 10, now there's a 10 year plan that does not include by the people who control this money and it does not include funding for our projects. Is that, is that I'm, I'm checking for understanding. Am I correctly grasping what's being said here? Sorry, I had an unmuting and clicking too many places issue. Um, yes, it's a, of when the funding would be um, available to the city, but yes. But that's not very... for more than 10 years. I mean, then you'd have to fund, the, if you wanted to do the project within 10 years, you'd have to project fund the project 100% yourselves and then hope that at some point there was money for the more money that might pay down some of that funding? Is that the current thinking? I think I'm gonna to have to follow up on that. I just don't want to offer the information incorrectly as a summary. Okay, I mean but that's- I, But I definitely will share the, the letters that are public right now with the committee. I'll, I'll share those because it provides a little more context on the expectations uh, right. of what the funding was going to do as well as some of the setbacks that we anticipate. Great. Uh, Mr. Chaka, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I, I think, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this topic either, but I, I think what's going on is the money is being used for uh, BART to San Jose. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's like the money is just delayed. I think it's the money is not going to be there ever. 
I think that's more the, the there's 10 years, but it's more like will probably not be there ever because it'll be used for the part to San Jose. That's what it, my understanding is, but I could be wrong, but I think that's what's going on. And I think the bigger issue is this really has to do with uh, VTA representation. I mean, I think most of you guys know, but VTA is largely dominated by San Jose. They have most of the votes. Um, in fact, we don't really have a formal vote ourselves as a city. And um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a larger issue of, you know, taxation without representation, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, I, I don't think it's necessarily a good thing for our city. And it's something which uh, I think, um, you know, I think we're gonna, well, I, I don't know, I don't know if there's legal things we can do, but it's definitely not a good thing. Well, let me just, I mean, come around to a point that I, I know I've made before, but I'll, it seems even more, more important now is I think the school community has not had an opportunity to really engage <clears throat> with this process um, because of the, obviously the unprecedented pressing matters we have just getting school open. Um, and so the amount of review or engagement with the XCAP process or the alternatives that are being proposed or anything else has been minimal. And I do not think that, and I think that as I said before, I could undermine or, or slow down or potentially jeopardize the kind of consensus building process that you're trying to enter into as the SCAP put forward, puts forward proposals. Um, I've always thought that was vital for a lot of reasons, but one of which is that you were gonna probably have to go to the community for funding uh, for this and having consensus and, and all the stakeholders standing behind your proposals when you're going out for funding is obviously important. Now, if you're going to have to fund even more, uh, it's even more of an issue that uh, the, the one of the major sources of funding seems to have gone away, and still, you know, one of the major stakeholders has not been engaged and probably won't stand behind your recommendations. So, just I, I just want to be, uh, and that's not you know me speaking as a as a school board member. That's just me speaking as an observer of the situation. That I think uh, you know one of the major stakeholder groups um, affected by the Churchill Crossing is not has not been really um, very engaged with your process and is not likely to stand up and say yeah we think the community should tax itself for this. Um, so something to be something to be cognizant of as you go through your process. Other comments? Okay, wow, that's a that was a wake up. Okay, we, the only, all we have left is future meetings and agendas. This instantiation of the committee, this membership has one more meeting because uh, we do always uh, have in the past always met in December um, and I don't see any reason not to do so uh, this December. Um, Ms. Gaines, did you wanna, did you raise your hand? There? Yes, sorry, my hand. I forget how high to raise it so that it can be seen. Um, the- I saw, I saw the tips of your fingers. Boy. I know. Um, we have been in conversation with Project Safety Net and they are scheduled to come to your December meeting, which I believe is the, let me get the exact date just so I'm not making it up, December 17th. So Project Safety Net is meeting with their regular board meeting today and they'll be discussing their presentation to bring to you in December. And we also spoke with Alcove, hoping that we could have the same meeting date for them to present, but they have to do a little bit more coordination on their part. and. Um, their offices with the holidays, it won't work for them to come in December. So they requested to be able to come to your first meeting in 2021. So I know it'll be a different, potentially different iteration of our group, but I just wanted to throw that out there that that can be one of the first things for 2021 as that presentation, um, they have a lot of interest in coming. They just are unable to do December. What was the second group? I didn't hear the name. Uh, Alcove. I'm always questioning my pronunciation. Um, there was a request from you guys to do the Alcove presentation along with Project Safety Net as is sort of- Alcove is the new group? Yeah, a team yes. mental health uh, group. Uh, Dr. Edelstein and his group, right? Okay. Yes, so they, they said that they would be able to come but not in December. Okay, which probably means in the past, this group has not been able to pull together a January meeting, so probably February. Um, yes, and I gave them a heads up that that was probably the um, the expectation that January might be a push, so February would likely be it. Okay, 
Well, that'll be a good way to start off the new year for the new for whoever's on the group. Um, okay, so project safety net. That's that's great. I think that's a good meaty item. It would be great. Tell them, you know, we have a big appetite for this. So, you know, if they want to take some time and present their material, I think we would love to love to get a thoroughgoing update. Um, any other agenda items for either December or otherwise? Okay. Um, great. So thank you, everybody. I don't, unless there are any other comments or I think that's it for our agenda and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays. Hi, everyone. Thank you.